Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Whitney Van Lanningham and Stranger Things is back, baby! At first I was like, it's gonna take me how long to watch this? But 15 minutes into the first episode, I knew that seven episodes wasn't nearly enough. I love this season, even though I think it's really rude of Netflix to make us wait for the finale. So in the meantime, I'm gonna break down all the details you might have missed in Stranger Things 4 Volume 1. On to the Upside Down. Chapter 1, The Hellfire Club opens in a quiet neighborhood in Hawkins, Indiana, where the local paperboy from the Hawkins Post is delivering newspapers. This is the same newspaper that Nancy and Jonathan were fired from in season 3 thanks to the influence of the Mind Flayer. At one house, a man opens the door for the paper, and through a series of close-up shots, we learn that this is Dr. Brenner. He fills out a crossword in 10 minutes, and most of the words are pretty standard crossword fare, but I find it particularly interesting that a shot centers on the word ideological, which means serving to explain something by giving the cause or reason for it. This is a subtle clue about Brenner's role this season, as his plotline centers around the origin of both Eleven and the new BBE from the Upside Down. This very opening itself is a part of this etiological tale, as it takes place on September 8, 1979, the day an 8-year-old Eleven would find herself at the center of a bloodbath in Hawkins National Laboratory. If you look closely, you can see a slight tear to the Upside Down, a hint to the full story revealed in Episode 7. We flash forward to March of 1986, six months and apparently several character growth spurts after the Battle of Star Court in Season 3. The Mamas and the Papas California Dream and plays as we enter Eleven's room, door left open with a 3 inch minimum just like she promised Hop in Season 3. That looks like a mini clone of Joyce, who is now working as a telemarketer for Encyclopedia Britannica. Jonathan is a big old stoner with a best friend named Argyle. When we catch up with Will, he's getting his Picasso on and a Boys Don't Cry Cure poster hangs in his studio. Moments later, we see Will carrying an Alan Turing poster for a school project. Alan Turing was a mathematician and considered the father of artificial intelligence technology. Turing was persecuted for being gay in the 1950s, so this seems to be another nod that Will is a friend of Dorothy, which has been hinted at throughout the series. Back in Hawkins, the party has joined a new D&D group called the Hellfire Club, a reference to the elite secret society that often came into conflict with the X-Men in Marvel Comics. The Hellfire Club is DM'd by Eddie Munson, a metal punk seeker of darkness who is not like the other warlocks, and introduces his bandmates from Corroded Corpse, Dustin, Mike, and Lucas sometimes. This year, Lucas is double-timing their Cult of Vecna campaign with the Tigers basketball team, and from the moment Team Captain Jason drags up the names of the recently deceased for a pep rally chant, you just know that this is a team of small town jock douchebags. Satanic panic is in full swing, and Eddie reads an article in Newsweek about the horrors of D&D turning our kids into violent, pot smoking devil worshippers. Apparently, this is also the issue that came out in the aftermath of the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster in January of 1986. As he reads, I was a teenage werewolf by the cramps plays in the background. When Dustin calls Steve to see if he can sub to their game, the phone booth he uses at Hawkins High has graffiti that reads ET phone home and give me head until I'm dead. The latter being a crude expression worn on a t-shirt by the character Booger in 84's Revenge of the Nerds. Robin and Steve's friendship is still going strong and they have an impassioned conversation about boobies, where Steve references the iconic Phoebe Kate scene from Fast Times at Ridgemont High that happens 53 minutes and 5 seconds into the film. Max, on the other hand, is really strong struggling in the aftermath of Billy's death. Not only is Baby Girl listening to Running Up That Hill by Kate Bush on repeat, she's been seeing the school guidance counselor, Miss Kelly, for her recurring nightmares, headaches, and depression. She's not the only student seeing Miss Kelly for these symptoms, however. Cheerleader Chrissy Cunningham, basketball Jason's girlfriend, is suffering from waking nightmares where a monster appears to her, mimicking her mother and reinforcing her eating disorder. The same way that this creature imitates your worst fears and deepest trauma is drawn from several classic 80s horror flicks, It, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Evil Dead. Jonathan also has an Evil Dead poster in his bedroom. Chrissy shares a last name with the Cunninghams, the idyllic family from Happy Days. Chrissy's hallucinations keep getting worse, so she arranges a drug deal with Eddie. But this time, her waking nightmare takes her into the Upside Down and face to face with season 4's big bad, Vecna. The way her body breaks is similar to the body horror in The Exorcist. Because the boys on bikes have always used Dungeons and Dragons as a lens to process who these horrific monsters are and what they want, they dub this beast Vecna in reference to D&D's most powerful lich. Vecna Vecna is a name that's been around in D&D lore since the early days. In 1990, he finally made an appearance in the Vecna Lives adventure model, which is the inspiration for Eddie's game, as noted by Vecna exclaiming, Vecna Lives! During this scene, Mike also name drops Cass, Vecna's canon right-hand lieutenant that rebelled against him in a bid for power, much like a Sith apprentice would try to overthrow their master. Eddie's Vecna doesn't scare Dustin, and he pulls out his best Han Solo impression to say, never tell me the odds. Chapter 2, Vecna's Curse, shows the kids picking up Mike at the airport in California to kick off the start of spring break. 
Interestingly, the date he arrives is March 22nd, 1986. The next day. And we learned that that's Will's birthday in season two, so did everyone just forget? Is he getting 16 candles? Murray actually arrives in town at the same time. He's here to help Joyce figure out her Russian ransom note. The cab driver who gives him a lift has a Hulk Hogan trading card hanging in the mirror. Notice that he's wearing blue shorts, as opposed to his famous red and gold shorts that were popularized around 1986. Eleven takes Mike and Will to Rinkamania, the local skating rink, to have a bitch in time. But Angela and her friends crank up Wipeout by the safaris and pull a prank on her, dragging her to the center of the rink, slinging her around, and dumping a milkshake on her. This scene evokes the same imagery as Carrie, except a chocolate shake is at least a little better than animal blood. When Angela refuses to apologize, Elle smacks her in the face with a roller skate, which, to be fair, she kind of deserved. Max awakens from another traumatic nightmare to find the cops swarming Eddie Munson's trailer across the street. Interestingly, although Scream didn't come out until 1996, many of the shots and musical cues in this scene are similar to the scene where cops and reporters are swarming the high school in the aftermath of Casey's vicious murder. The basketball team hears the news of her death in their party clubhouse, which used to be Benny's Burgers, when Eleven hit out in season one. Max catches Dustin up to speed, while watching Courtney Cox's Misfits of Science, where Cox plays a woman with telekinesis just like Elle, Max's lights flickered, and she saw Eddie hightail it out of there. Dustin knows that there's no way Eddie could have killed someone, and they decide to find him before the cops, or even the basketball team do. The Hellfires stop at the video store to add Robin and Steve to their quest, and I'm not gonna lie y'all, it would take up the entire video if I just listed out every single VHS case inside a family video, so let's focus on the prominently featured movies in these scenes. There's a cutout of Eddie Murphy from Beverly Hills Cop, a girl rents Dr. Zhivago, there's a poster for the man with one red shoe, another for Raiders of the Lost Ark, a Freddy Krueger cutout, a National Lampoon European vacation cutout, a Teen Wolf poster, a Gremlins cutout, and a Last Dragon poster that hints at the martial arts shenanigans to come. They actually find Reefer Rick's address, where Eddie is hiding, by checking out his rental history composed entirely of stoner flicks like Fast Times and Cheech and Chong. When Nancy talks to Wayne Munson, Eddie's uncle, he tells her the story of Victor Creel, a serial killer who committed identical murders to these, and compares him to Michael Myers from Halloween. When Nancy's friend from the school paper, Fred, is killed, we see Vecna plugged into his tentacly charging station and a large creepy house in the Upside Down, a nod to Hellraiser. In Chapter 3, The Monster and the Superhero, the Hellfires make some headway. Nancy and Robin find an article linking Creel's murders to a demon. Max breaks into the guidance counselor's office to research the other victims and realizes she has similar symptoms to those who died. Dustin references the Watergate scandal, which happened during Nixon's presidential run, as Max searches for the files. Two of the files, labeled John Bonacourse and Ray Brown, are names of members on the Stranger Things production crew. When the Tigers show up to Corroded Corpse's band practice, their garage is exploding floating with metal references. We've got Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, Motorhead, and the band's own sick as hell poster. Back in California, Joyce and Murray leave for Alaska. But even though Jonathan offers to take the kids to see Police Academy 3, Eleven pushes Mike away when he tries to talk to her about the skate attack. In her room, you can see a poster for the 1877 film For the Love of Benji, a retro Coke clock, a flag from Dynamite Falls Adventure Golf, and the National Guard's official recruitment poster from 1972, which I suspect used to belong to Hopper, along with what looks like his old police badge hanging on her wall. Before the police show up to arrest Elle for assault, Jonathan and Will are watching the animated Ewok series. Chapter 4, Dear Billy, opens with Jonathan, Will, and Mike speaking with the agent sent to protect them by Owens. John refers to them as Ponch and John, the two main characters from Chips. Mike receives a goodbye note from Elle, telling him she's gone off to become a superhero again, but she signs it from because psionic powers do not make her exempt from acting like a dramatic teenage girl. In Will's room, you can see posters for Jaws in the Little Shop of Horrors musical and the board game Payday. Luckily, the boys call Argyle for a ride, and he shows up blasting past the duchy by musical youth just in time to save them from a military shootout in their home. At the Sinclair's, Erica greets Jason at the door and confirms his suspicions that Lucas is working with the Hellfire Club. In her room, you can see a My Little Pony poster, and she tells Jason that if she has to keep covering for her brother, Lucas is going to owe her an NES system with Duck Hunt, which was released in 1984. While Nancy and Robin get ready to go undercover at the Pennhurst Mental Hospital, Robin points out that Nance has a sweet Tom Cruise poster. Top Gun wasn't released until later on in 1986, so her crush must have come from risky business. And Pennhurst itself is a callback to its mention in season one. I bet she escaped from Pennhurst. From where? The nut house in Curly County? As well as an IRL former psychiatric facility with a haunted history. When they arrive, patients in the music room have written their song selections on the board, including Moonlight Serenade by the Glenn Miller Orchestra, Red Sails in the Sun 
Sunset by The Platters, I'll See You in My Dreams by Isham Jones and Gus Khan, and Wrap Your Troubles in Dreams by Bing Crosby. The director of the facility explains that music has a calming effect on unstable minds. The girls are led down a dark hallway to Victor Creel's cell, evoking imagery from The Silence of the Lambs. And Creel himself is also an Easter egg. The actor who plays him is Robert Englund, aka Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street. He explains that he survived his little run-in with Vecna when the song Dream a Little Dream of Me by Etta James brought him back to reality. Armed with this info, the two walk Dustin to tell him to play Max's favorite song and hope that it'll bring her back to them. As soon as Max hears Kate Bush's running up that hill, a portal opens back up to the real world and she wrestles herself away from Vecna's grasp. Not only does this scene evoke similar imagery to the music video, the lyrics to the chorus say, If only I could, I'd make a deal with God and get him to swap our places. A nod to the way that she wishes she would have died instead of Billy. Back in Russia, Hopper manages to escape Kamchatka against all odds, fleeing to Yuri's safe house at a church near the prison. Seeing Hopper reunite with a container of Jif peanut butter brought tears to my eyes. And so did that banging poster of Elvira. Gentlemen, your face is important. It's what people see on Zooms and in your passport photo. You should be expending some extra effort to keep it looking good. The fine folks at Geology have some great skincare products that you're gonna love. Geology is a nine-time award-winning men's skincare company that creates simple, effective, personalized skincare products for men. Click the link in this video's description and take a 30-second quiz. Tell them about your skin and their team of dermatologists will design a regimen just for you that ships directly to your door. Their products are great for whatever you're worried about. Acne, dark eye circles, or wrinkles. They send you a 30-day trial set that's easy to incorporate into your routine, whether you're new to skincare or a seasoned expert. The gentlemen of New Rockstars are big fans of their fancy eye cream. Our house might be late to pump out content, but they don't look like it thanks to this cream. Geology makes it easy to take care of your skin. No need to become an amateur dermatologist. They're offering a wild deal right now. You can get 70% off on their 30-day five-piece trial kit. Head to geology.com to get 70% off on your 30-day trial when you use the code ROCKSTAR70 or just click the link below. That's geology.com, promo code ROCKSTAR70 to save 70% off on your 30-day trial. I want to see your skin. In Chapter 5, The Nina Project, the boys find a hidden note inside of a pen that gives them a number to call to warn Eleven that the government is after her. The number is 202-968-6161, and if you give it a ring, you can hear the same dial-up modem tone that the boys heard. Will says that it reminds him of War Games, a 70s techno sci-fi thriller about a hacker who accidentally accesses an American supercomputer programmed to simulate and execute war against the Soviets. Eleven is taken to a secret underground lab. Although Owens tries to butter her up by telling her that the scientists there think of her as Madonna, it's quickly revealed that Dr. Brenner, aka Papa, is behind all of this. The scar on his face is a reminder of the last time we saw him encounter the Demogorgon in season one. Brenner and Owens have built a machine called the Nina after Nicholas Dollarock's 1786 opera of the same name, about a girl who loses all of her memories after her lover dies in a duel. The Nina is supposed to work by walking Eleven through her childhood memories in order to restore her lost powers. And forgive me if I say this wrong, but Quan de la Vienne Ami Reviendra by Dalarak plays. It plays again at the end of the episode when Elle briefly gets her powers back. The Duffer brothers also chose the name Nina in reference to Nina Kulagina, a Soviet woman who claimed to have telekinesis and her claims allegedly started the psychic arms race, launching the U.S.'s research into psionic abilities. The orderly that Elle speaks to in the Rainbow Room's character design is only one black bowler hat away from matching yeah. Alexander Delarge from A Clockwork Orange. As she's put through the ringer with Firestarter-esque challenges to her psyche, He's seemingly her only friend inside of the lab. As Yuri's plane takes off and Joyce pleads for her life, Travelin' Man by Ricky Nelson starts to play in sharp juxtaposition to their bleak, snowy journey. Murray uses his newfound karate skills and kicks ass midair, quoting Okinawan martial artist Choshin Shibana when he says his mantra, my fingers are like arrows, my arms like iron, my feet like spears. Shibana developed the show in Ryu fighting style in 1928. The plane crashes, but all three survive. In the Wheeler's basement, you can see the game Simon on the table when Nancy answers Eddie's call for a food supply drop. Max draws what she remembers from the Upside Down, and Nancy fits the pieces together to form Victor Creel's house. Dustin points out that Max may have infiltrated Vecna's mind in the same way he infiltrated hers, and references Freddy Krueger's boiler room, where Freddy took his victims just before killing them. When Steve goes for a flashlight at the house, 
Dustin's bag is adorned in a Slimer pin from Ghostbusters and a patch from Camp Nowhere where he met Susie last season. And you gotta love a kid who can quote Sherlock Holmes, which leads me to believe that Dustin is also a fan of Jeremy Brett's TV role as the famous detective that began airing in 84. The Hellfires figure out that the lights are flickering in the same way that the buyers were in season one, and conclude Vecna is with them just on the other side. In an homage to Reservoir Dogs, the tigers show up at Eddie's decked out in suits after Chrissy's funeral, hoping to beat his ass for her murder. The SpaghettiOs Eddie cooked earlier betray him, and Jason and Patrick swim after him as he tries to escape Lover's Lake on a broken boat. As the lights flicker at the Creel house, Vecna possesses and kills Patrick. In Chapter 6, The Dive, the Hellfires get a walkie from Eddie, who tells them he's hiding at the local makeout spot, Skull Rock. On their way, Dustin's compass isn't working, and he realizes that this must mean that a gate to the Upside Down is nearby. In this ep, he's wearing a 1986 Crafts Furry Banjo Tournament shirt from Vermont. The gang asks Eddie to join them now that they understand how Vecna attacks, and he references Lord of the Rings in his response. I say you're asking me to follow you into Mordor. But, uh, the Shire is burning. So Mordor it is. When Steve is pulled in through the gate to the Upside Down, the monsters that attack him are likely Sturges, mosquito bat hybrid beasts from D&D lore. In Utah, the boys arrive at Susie's house, which is filled with her fundamentalist brothers and sisters. One of her sisters quotes Shakespeare's Henry IV as she sword fights, saying, You starveling, you elf skin, you dried meat's tongue. This is my kind of party. And I'm guessing that this director fancies himself a young Todd Browning, the director of 1931's Dracula. On the timeout board, you can see that Susie has one strike against her from when she helped change Dustin's grades in episode one. As the dudes explain what they need her help with, you can see that Susie has a flag from Brigham Young University, Wizard of Oz, and the Muppet movie, a couple of Raggedy Ann dolls, and obviously a framed photo of Jesus. This house has a whole lot of Jesus. The software Susie's computer uses is Amiga Workbench, which would have been a recent upgrade for them, as it was released in 1985. She also has to explain to Jonathan what the internet is. Susie finds that a call came from a computer in Nevada and prints out the coordinates. In Russia, Hopper prepares to fight the Demogorgon as punishment for his escape attempt. He steals vodka and a lighter from one of the guards and tells Antonov that he's gonna try to scare it with fire, a tactic we learned in season two. While playing hospital grade Plinko, the orderly tells Eleven a rumor about a boy called One, who was more powerful than any of the other students. He was able to unlock his powers by summoning a strong, unhappy memory, and Eleven uses this tip to win a fight against her bully, Two. Unfortunately, Two and his cronies isolate Elle in the rainbow room, shut the cameras off, and start tossing her around the room with their minds. And now we understand why what happened at Rinkamania was extra shitty for her, and why she felt like her boyfriend didn't understand what she's been through through, despite Mike being bullied himself. When she emerges from Nina, she's fully convinced that she was the one responsible for the deaths at Hawkins' lab that day. Chapter 7, The Massacre at Hawkins' Lab, begins with Steve fighting for his life as those Sturges deliver like at least 20 HP of damage before Nancy, Robin, and Eddie dive in to save him. He decapitates the bat, and Eddie comments that it was a metal as heck Ozzy Osbourne style move. I mean, that was a real Ozzy move you pulled back there. At Nancy's upside down house, they don't find any weapons, but they do find her diary, dated November 6, 1983, aka the day of the vanishing of Will Byers, and the day that Eleven opened the gate in Hawkins. She realizes that the upside down made a copy of Hawkins that day, and everything there is frozen in time. At Kamchatka, Murray once again flawlessly impersonates a Russian comrade just like he did in season three, and they're led to the Demogorgon arena. Hopper staves the monster off with fire, and he and Antonov are able to escape. On the other side, he greets Joyce with even more love in his eyes than when he tasted that peanut butter. Back in Hawkins, Dustin, Lucas, and Max are being grilled by the cops and their parents about the Hellfire Club. After Erica makes fun of them, What is this, gun smoke? The stupid and the ugly? In a sick burn referencing the good, the bad, and the ugly, she demands that they fill her in as she sips from a Minute Maid juice box. Her questions help Dustin realize Vecna's true motive. She raises an essential question. To establish psychic connections with his victims in order to tear multiple gates to the Upside Down open. Steve realizes that he can hear the others through the Upside Down, so they try to make contact. By interacting with a glittering red electric mist, they flash Morse code for SOS, similar to the way that Will made contact with Joyce via Christmas lights in season one. Lucas steals Holly's light bright, but don't worry, Teddy Rockspin and Grubby will keep her company. They use it to communicate with the others in the Upside Down, and Dustin dubs the gate at Lover's Lake Watergate, explaining that there are multiple gates open at each murder site. The boys on bikes are back in action, even if two of them are girls, as they race to Eddie's Upside Down trailer. The kids in Hawkins bust open the gate, and the teens have to climb upwards in order to drop back down into the real world. Although Eddie and Robin make it out safely, Nancy is possessed by Vecna as she climbs. She falls into the swimming pool where Barb was killed, and Slug 
Barb even makes a cameo. At the lab, Eleven is back in her memory of the day when Brenner challenged her to crush a Coke can with her mind, which we saw her flash back to in season one after seeing an ad on TV. This time, however, she can't do it. Brenner explains that she's regressing and encourages her to go through one final memory in order to see the full picture of who she is as a person. Ella isn't a superhero or a monster because the world isn't black and white. She's a whole person with good and bad inside of her. Elle suits up in her sensory deprivation tank suit one last time, and Brenner fires up the Nina with video footage from September 8th, 1979. The orderly convinces Eleven to escape, and she offers to free him from the chip in his neck so that he can come with her. The chip is called Soteria named for the Greek goddess of safety and deliverance. This is actually a hint that the chip is what's protecting everyone else from his dangerous powers. As soon as he's freed, he attacks the guards and reveals his 001 tattoo to L. Dun dun dun! He was one all the time! And also apparently the son of Victor Creel. He tells Eleven his side of the story while Nancy explores the memory of his home in the Upside Down. One explains that he feels that each human life is just a weaker copy of the previous, which it turns out is exactly why Eleven was born. Brenner wanted to recreate one, but less powerful and easier to control, which is why he started the program. His speech actually reminds me of Tyler Durden's complaint that everything is a copy of a copy of a copy from Fight Club. We learn Elle defeated one, summoning the power of love to blast his ass into the next dimension and open up the first gate to the Upside Down. He disintegrates like the Demogorgon she kills at the end of season one, and as he falls through the sky, he's shocked with red lightning that distorts his body. But even those gnarly tentacles can't hide his 001 tattoo, and that's the last thing that we see before we have to wait for the last two episodes to drop. I still have so many questions! Like, how was one formed if the others are a copy of him? What's Nancy's favorite song so that they can get her out of the Upside Down? And what the hell did Erica find hidden under Lucas's bed that was so gross? We might never know the answers to that last one, but hopefully these and all of our other burning inquiries will be answered in the final eps. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at WhitneyPuppy, follow New Rockstars, subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love, and thanks for watching. Bye!